Okay, so let's get started. Obviously, lecture topic, keeping healthy for the holidays. So here's just some of the topics we're going to over, go over, sort of nutrition essentials, intro to nutrition as a whole, healthy food substitutions. So this gets into more like practical application for some of the stuff that we're going to be going through. Um, same deal with the cooking tips, and then just a little bit of debunking some of the nutrition myths and facts and some of the diets and fads that are out there right now. So we'll get started right there. So all disease begins in the gut. Hippocrates, father of modern medicine. So we've been talking about nutrition for a really long time, 400 BC is when we kind of first started realizing some of the links between some of the things we're eating and some of the disease processes that are going on. Diabetes, certain cancers, a lot of different things all originate with your nutritional foundation. So this stuff is important, is really just the emphasis of this. It is important going forward, and sometimes this alone can be enough to get rid of some of the pain you're experiencing, get rid of some of the conditions that you're dealing with. And so it really is something that's not really secondary, how people usually think of nutrition. It should be sort of the primary focus and really the foundation of your health moving forward. So getting into why nutrition is essential. Every single process in your body is dependent on what you are ingesting. If you don't ingest the right nutrients, and that's macronutrients and micronutrients, you are not going to be able to function and you definitely won't be able to function optimally. So all major organ systems depend on various types of nutrients and then like I was just saying, this can be the primary cause of disease processes, and here's just a few of them on a long list of many more. So if you can get this down and really fine-tune your nutrition, it leads to a longer lifespan and it leads to just a better quality of life overall. Get into this. So fuel for your body is sort of the most basic understanding of nutrition. You need energy, calories are energy. That's your fuel for your body. At rest, everybody has something called a base metabolic rate. So that's calories that you burn through your daily life doing nothing. That's just what your body needs to run on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that doesn't take into account like your activity level, your exercise, all that type of stuff. It takes into account your body composition. So how much muscle mass you have. Um, different genetic factors are a big part of this, but we're not getting into that today. But there's a lot of factors that go into play in terms of just what you're burning without doing anything. Even sex is involved in that as well. So man versus female, dramatically different things. Hormonal cycles, a lot of different things are in play in terms of what that base metabolic rate is. And who you are going into the winter months now, your base metabolic rate actually slows down. There's hormonal cycling that goes for every single person. I'm not going to get into all the details of but you will actually burn less calories at rest going into winter months. We're not exactly like bears, we don't hibernate, but our body goes through a similar process gearing up for the colder weather months. Less activity, more time indoors, we need to store that energy. So it's going to be naturally harder for you to lose weight going into these months. Doesn't mean it can't be done, but it does mean you wanna be a little bit more conscious of nutrition, of what you're putting into your body. Um, so like I was saying, protein, carbs, and fats, these are your macronutrients. So these are the major building blocks. These are where you get your calories from. Vitamins and minerals, these are your micronutrients. So these are the, the little things, the extras, that are important for all keeping all those organ systems functioning and function, functioning well. So now we're going to break down a little bit of those macronutrients I was talking about. So we'll start with the fats. So... Just on a basic level, we've got good fats, we've got bad fats. So good fats, these tend to be omega-3s, fish oils. A lot of those terms have been thrown, thrown around a lot. Now, those omega-3s are a class of fats called polyunsaturated fatty acids. We're not going to get into that. All you need to know is that there are good fats, bad fats. These good fats help improve your heart health. They improve your vascular system health. This anti-inflammatory pamphlet that you have right there really focuses on a lot of these good fat versus bad fat issues that I'm talking about and promoting an anti-inflammatory environment in the body. Now, 
Inflammation is a word that gets thrown a lot about, thrown around a lot, and it's kind of confusing if you don't know what people are talking about because you think like, oh, like if you're sick or like if you hit your elbow, you, you get inflammation. But what we're talking about here is very low grade systemic inflammation. So you're not feeling pain or discomfort necessarily when you eat a Big Mac, but it does upregulate inflammatory pathways in the body. Now those inflammatory pathways then cause damages to your vascular system most notably, so your heart, your blood vessels, and then can cause hardening of the arteries. So that's the main thing that we're talking about preventing when we're talking about cutting down on inflammation. There's a lot of other benefits, but that's sort of the main focus, and that's kind of what people think about when they're talking about good fats. Now bad fats increase this inflammation. The main bad fat that we're talking about is something called a trans fat. And trans fats exist in very processed foods. So like your Twinkies, your Big Macs, all of these foods that are coming in a plastic package and some of the stuff that you're just throwing in a microwave type deal, those have a higher concentration of trans fats. And trans fats, trans fats are the only ones that are truly the bad fats. Most of those aren't even going to be listed when you're looking at things. You, you won't turn it over, and it could say 0% trans fats. There's still trans fats in there based on different processing techniques and also based on how the nutrition, the nutrition label is produced. So companies find ways around things to kind of make you think you're getting a healthy option when you're not. And we'll go into that a little bit more when we get into the more practical stuff. So good fats, bad fats. Focus on the good fats, and we'll go through a little bit later what the good fats are, what the foods you want to focus on. Now we're getting into carbs. So some of this same stuff with inflammation plays into carbs as well, but with carbs, we're really, really focused on simple versus complex. So a simple carbohydrate is like your white bread, your white sugar. The white carbs are considered simple carbs. Now what simple is is goes through a process pretty much where the food product, all of the nutrition is removed from it. So it's bleached, it's additives are thrown into it to make it more flavorful, there's a lot of sugar usually added into it, and then that's your final product. With a complex carb, none of the stuff is removed from it. You're getting like a whole raw food. There's still like a processing that goes into creating bread obviously, but it's not as intense as what like white bread is. Now the main distinction between complex and simple is all those other nutrients that were removed in simple aren't removed in complex. So you're still eating a carb, you're still getting the same carb content, so it still has calories, but it's digested a lot more slowly, so you don't get these big spikes in insulin which make you tired and crash and sugar crash and all of that. And then you also still get the added benefit of nutrition beyond just the macro of your calories. So fiber is really important in your diet because it slows the process of digestion and it'll allow for a slower, more gradual energy source for your body compared to a simple carb, so white bread, instantly processed, huge amount of sugar gets thrown into your blood and you have a big insulin spike a lot of metabolic processes have to go on and your body basically looks at this huge spike and is like, we have to start storing. So you're going to store more fat when you're talking about a simple carb versus a complex carb because of that big spike in sugar that happens and your body's like, we need to store this. And this gets into some, a common misconception too. People think like, oh, eating fat makes you fat. No, no, no. Eating excess is what adds to weight gain. So and that's true within any of these categories. So like recently carbs have come under attack a lot of people are doing like a low carb diet and everything. And the main reason because of that is because carbs get added into just about everything you eat. If you look on the back of a label, added sugars are in tons of different food products and that's all carb. So the carbs are under attack because they get added to so many different foods, not because they're innately bad for you. So it's easy to overeat these just because they're so ubiquitous in the general diet. Now proteins, this I want you to worry the least about, but essentially there's complete and incomplete proteins. Complete 
have all the essential amino acids. So your body, amino acids are what your body uses to create a lot of things in terms of your metabolism, different byproducts, different things that you need to run the organs in your body. Every animal product, every meat has all the essential amino acids. You don't have to worry about that. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, this is something you do have to con be concerned about because plant products don't have all those amino acids. So you need some sort of supplement, you need something else to make sure that you're getting everything, all the proteins necessary for the building blocks of your body. In a normal, in a general diet, this isn't so much concerning. If you're getting into like bodybuilding, weightlifting, we can talk a little bit more about this, but I don't know if anybody in here is interested in that yet. <laughs> So now let's get into some healthy substitutions. We're talking with baking and cooking, oils, flours, different proteins, different sweeteners that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And now we're getting into more practical stuff. So oils and butters. Good oils we're talking about. Coconut oil and coconut butter. Now the, the downside, not necessarily a downside, but coconut oil and coconut butter is what's called a saturated fat. So, Saturated fat is one of those things that has come under attack in the past as being like a bad fat because it, getting back to inflammation, it causes some inflammation. Your body needs saturated fat though actually to maintain cell membranes and to keep up some of the metabolism going on. So saturated fat in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It's again one of those things where it's a little bit easier to overeat. So you got to be att pay attention to what your diet is like. If you have a diet that's really high in red meat, you might want to cut back on your saturated fat intake because that becomes a little bit more challenging and you can lead to more inflammation. If you're just talking about, eh, maybe I have like red meat once or twice a week, we're less concerned about your saturated fat intake. Going into avocado oil. Now we're talking about a whole different class of fat that actually has cardioprotective effects. So the, the oil that's present in avocados and oils, and sorry, in olive oil specifically, is separate from some of the fats we've talked about, and it's still a good fat, and it still has benefits to your cardiovascular system. Now when we get into butter, so first of all, Margarine became popular in like the 90s. Margarine is what we call kind of like a Frankenstein fat. Mar margarine is like a processed creation that is essentially sort of functions like a trans fat in your body and really isn't something that you should be using. Butter is honestly a better option even though it is saturated fat. If you use grass-fed butter, there is a different fatty acid makeup there that actually is a little bit healthier. It's not dramatic, it's still going to be saturated fat, but it is going to be a little bit less inflammatory. But the main, main take home, yep? What exactly is grass-fed butter? So grass-fed butter, basically the milk that they're using to create the butter is just coming from cows that were okay. grass-fed, okay. yep. And this gets into a little bit into, um, most of our livestock is fed corn. And most of that corn is actually also a Frankenstein crop. It's very polluted with GMOs at this point in the U.S. It's a big issue. It's the most subsidized crop in the entire U.S. If you want to learn a little bit more about our corn issue, there's a great book. It's called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And it goes very deep into our corn crop, how it's been cultivated, how it's been modified, and what we're actually dealing with. And this is part of the issue with high fructose corn syrup which is another thing you want to avoid. And if I had to emphasize the main thing you want to avoid, it's going to be high fructose corn syrup because it's so dense, it's so added to so many products. So if you look at a nutrition label and you see that, I'm going to tell you to go find something else. Kerrygold butter and grass-fed butter that's available. Great, Kerrygold. exactly. Kerrygold. Yeah, Kerrygold. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a great option, exactly. And actually, it also reminds me of another point. Some of these substitutions, when you're talking about a recipe, it's not an even switch. So if I'm telling you, like, let's try, like, almond flour instead of white, white flour, you can't just take out the white flour and put in almond flour. You've got to find a new recipe, otherwise you're going to end up with party guests that don't like you. <laughs> They're not going to want to eat it. They're not going to come back. No, exactly. And there are great recipes out there. And a, a, 
just a Google search will find you some good recipes that will use like these more healthy substitutions, but don't think that they bake the same way because they, right. they absolutely don't. I made somebody make some really bad pancakes once, so. <laughs> <laughs> Better? <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so getting over into the bad vegetable oil, a lot of them have a lot of trans fats. You don't really know what vegetable is going into it. It's highly processed. S same thing, we're getting into a lot of these like Frankenstein creations. It's made in the lab for the most part. You're not actually getting that whatever vegetable oil you're getting. Canola, canola oil, you deal with the same thing. And corn oil is, we're talking about that GMO issue that I was just kind of discussing. So going a little further, flowers. Good ones, bad ones. Like I said, we're keeping it simple. Coconut flour, like I said about the saturated fats, you're still dealing with some of that in a coconut flour creation. Almond flour has a nicer fat balance between the good ones and the bad ones. So I like using almond flour over a white flour. Same deal with oat, same deal with garbanzo bean, which is a, like chickpea flour, same deal. They make all of those products. All of them are gonna be better alternatives to your white bleached enriched flour. Um, that's another word that you'll see on a lot of things, enriched or fortified. Enriched and fortified either mean that in the processing of that product, all of the nutrients were removed and they added things back in, or most of them were removed and they just increased some of the levels again after the fact. So th those two terms are processing in and of themselves which isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but there's a lot better options out there than getting like white bread fortified with vitamin D. Like you can get vitamin D via other pathways. Best being the sun, but we're, we're kind of out of luck with that right now. <laughs> um, like I said, bad refined bleached flowers. Commonly used substitutions. So natural peanut butter and you'll know it's a natural peanut butter because the oil will separate, separate out on top. If you're looking at Jif, that stuff never separates. They're using an emulsifier, which is a chemical to keep everything condensed, connected. There's a lot of extra chemicals that go in that. There's a lot of sugar that's added to that. It's cheap, it tastes good, but it's not gonna have the same health benefit or the same nutrient profile as a natural peanut butter. So peanut butter itself is not necessarily bad for you Jif, Skippy, those guys are. <laughs> almond butter is a great alternative if you like almond butter. Like I said, better fatty acid profile there. Coconut milk, coconut butter, that's gonna have a saturated fat content, but as long as your diet's not too high in those saturated fats, still okay. Almond milk goes along with almond, cashew milk, Almond milk actually has a slightly better profile than cashew milk, so if you want to stick with almond milk, I'm cool with that. Cashew milk is actually a little bit sweeter if you can find it. It's usually a little bit harder to find and a little bit more expensive. So I like the almonds. I'm cool with them. <laughs> Free range, local eggs, and meats. So where your meat comes from actually does make a difference. I know you're like, you're like oh, organic or farm raised or whatever, and you see a higher price tag and all this stuff, but it does actually make a difference in how your body's processing that and what the meat is actually made up of. So when you're getting a factory farm raised animal, it's sort of a you are what you eat mentality. That tends to be raised on a very corn fed diet, and that corn, like I said, is a Frankenstein crop. So you end up with, the meat will taste fine, but it's very, very, very high in inflammatory fats, so bad fats. When you get a farm raised thing, totally different makeup, and you're actually dealing with a lot less of an inflammation based on that. Same is true with eggs. It's a little bit to a lesser extent, to be honest. Um, but definitely with your meats, and that's true chicken, turkey, cows, all of it. So probably a little late for Thanksgiving to like go and find your nice free range farm-raised turkey, but in the future, it does make a difference. Getting into sweeteners. So sweeteners get complicated. So there's non-digestible synthetic sugars out there, which are your Splendas, your Sweet and Low, your Equals. 
all of those will use different types of molecules, which are sweet, will give you that sweetness, but they have a neurotoxic effect, and some of them have been linked to some cancers. Now, we're not talking about like it moves the dial from like, oh, you won't have cancer to like maybe you will. Like, the dial moves increment incrementally, but it's significant, and it's enough that you want to avoid them, and if you're somebody who's drinking diet soda every day, it's enough to move the dial a little bit. So in terms of sweeteners, even though all of these natural sweeteners, alternatives to like white bleached sugar are still sugar, like you're still processing this as sugar, it's going to be a better alternative to those other non-digestible synthetic fake sweeteners. Um, the other thing we found with some of those fake sweeteners is they will actually induce some of the same insulin resistance issues that regular sugars will. And before we thought like, oh yeah, this is a bypass, this is, this is our loophole, like this is how you get around that, but now we realize the body actually will react in a similar way even though you don't have the same blood sugar spike. So some sweetener options. Local honey is kind of cool because there's some effects of it that we don't fully understand in terms of like benefiting allergies if you do get seasonal allergies. There's a lot of theories as to why that actually works and why it will actually cut down on sort of like your response to seasonal allergies, but nothing completely proven, but it has been anecdotally seen. There are some vitamins, some B vitamins in honey, and that's pretty much the main nutrient source that you're getting out of it. But like I said, it still is a sugar, so don't overdo it. Agave nectar, twice the sweetness of our like white bleached sugar. So you're getting more bang for your buck, it's still processed as sugar, and you're not getting much of an additional nutritional benefit, but you can use less of it to still get that sweetness that you're craving. Stevia, it's sort of a similar type thing. It's a little bit sweeter than sugar. This is a plant-based extract. So again, still processed like sugar, but you can use less of it. You can get a little bit more bang for your buck, and you'll have a little bit of a nutritional benefit. Um, coconut sugar, maple syrup, blackstrap molasses, I'd rather you use one of the, the first three because those ones tend to, well, coconut sugar you tend to need more of to get the effect. So people, you're, you're usually not really getting any benefit because you end up using double what you should be using anyway. And then maple syrup and molasses just tend to not be really ubiquitous. Like you're not gonna put syrup in your coffee. <laughs> so. so getting some baking cooking Replace one or more and you can feel a little bit less guilt. Like I said, you'll need to follow a different recipe. So these are replacements that you can make, but you do need to follow a different recipe if you're going to make those replacements. And that's true for the, the sweeteners too. So let's get into some of the myths. Like I said earlier, eating fat does not make you fat. Our body needs fat to function, it needs all those fats. So we need saturated fat, we need unsaturated fat. Eliminating fat from the diet doesn't necessarily eliminate it from the body. Carbs aren't bad for you, like I was saying earlier. And now we're getting into some of these diet food, diet sugar-free. So when something says sugar-free on it, it's using essentially those non-digestible synthetic sugars that I was talking about. So those chemicals <laughs> that your body will still respond to in the same way hormonally. So you'll still have that same sort of fat storage response without the blood sugar spike. So it still has a negative effect overall. I'd rather you stick with things that are just lower in sugar than try and beat the system because you're not really beating the system, unfortunately. These low fat products, you see, a lot of times are worse for you than the full fat because they're making up for the lack of taste from that low fat with more sugar. So if you flip it over and you look at that label, it's like, oh, these are low fat. And it's like, oh, there's 60 grams of sugar in there. So you gotta be careful when you see that low fat label. And to be honest, the low fat craze overall like, was a fabricated craze by the sugar industry. There was actually multiple New York Times articles published talking about how sugar companies paid off Harvard, Harvard scientists to cherry pick studies and publish and I'll give you the articles if you want. This isn't conspiracy theory stuff. This is real published fact that these scientists were paid off to cherry pick studies, shifting the blame of 
cardiac health and cardiac issues and diabetes from sugar onto saturated fat when we had evidence literally 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that sugar was becoming the real problem. And so for 30 plus years, we started adding sugars into things and blaming fat when fat wasn't our problem. So we end up with a food supply now where you gotta be careful and you gotta wade through it and you gotta pay attention to sugar more than anything else. If it's organic, it might be healthy. So this is a big one too. Organic labels don't make unhealthy foods suddenly healthy. So like organic potato chips, organic crackers, organic ice cream are still not healthy for you. <laughs> We're not gonna make those delicious foods good for you, I'm sorry. It just doesn't work like that. But organic food does mean it's made without the use of pesticides and fertilizers. Usually, not always, the animals will be treated more humanely. They'll have a better fatty acid profile from a nutrition standpoint. So when you're talking about like meats, per se, a lot of the times their organic label does mean something. Now there's sometimes companies that will get around this and find like loopholes within the labeling. But for the most part, I don't want to get too nitpicky. So organic as far as like your meats are concerned, organic free range, focus on those and you're probably getting a little bit of a better benefit. So in terms of shopping, you want to shop around the outside of the store, shop the perimeter, don't go down through the aisles. The aisles are where all the processed stuff is. Anything that is super processed, put in a box, put in a package, wrapped in plastic, that's going to have added sugar, it's, it's going to go through other processes and there's going to be added chemicals in there that your body doesn't like and your body doesn't process effectively. So you shop around the perimeter, that's where you're going to find your fresh foods. Generally, if your food can go bad, then it's good for you. If your food can't go bad, then you should be a little bit concerned. Unless we're like in the nuclear holocaust and we can all live on Twinkies, then like, great, like we planned. But as a rule of thumb, you wanna be eating food that is real whole food. Now in terms of compliance, because this is huge, don't ban the foods you love. If you like pizza, don't tell yourself, I am never gonna eat pizza ever again. And this is true for kids too, if you have kids, grandkids, anything. If you flat out ban a food, it shows basically down the road, the craving gets worse, the addiction to it gets much worse, and it becomes more of a problem. So the best thing to do is moderation. You wanna moderate things. You wanna eat in what's called percentage eating. So initially, if you're struggling to eat healthy, say, 50% of the week, I'm going to make healthy food choices. Or you could even start smaller than that. You can say 50% of the day. So for breakfast and lunch, I am going to do exactly what I'm supposed to do for dinner, that's my meal. And if that's your starting point, that's okay. You have to find a starting point and you have to be realistic with yourself. The first thing that I ask somebody in a nutrition consult is on a scale of one to 10 is, how serious are you about making changes to your diet and lifestyle to get the goals you want? And that's something you really need to think about before moving forward. Because if you're like, oh, I'm 10 out of 10, and you're not, you're just gonna end up disappointed, feeling dejected, and then you're not gonna be compliant and you're not gonna help. So you have to be realistic. Like, what's your starting point? Like, eh, I think I can do 40%. I think 40% of the week, so maybe a couple days, I can stick with it. And then you move from there. The goal, is 80% 80, 80 essentially. So somewhere around your five days out of seven days of the week, somewhere around your, all your meals and you maybe have some snacks that you don't you know, worry too much about, but somewhere around that 70 to 80% compliance with your diet is what you really kind of need to make the best results, the best progress. If you are one of those people that's very intense and very determined and very self-disciplined, go 100%. I have all power to you. If you think you can do it, go for it. But long-term compliance is really key when you're talking about nutrition. It's not really like, oh, how do I get through like a month of suffering? Because at the end of that month, you're going back to who you were. You need to find something that you're going to maintain and you're going to stick with. So that's why somewhere in that 78 to 80% working up to there is a reasonable goal that most people can achieve. And 
You don't have to be a psycho about it to do it. So, any questions about any of that? I know pretty much brief run through of a lot of different topics. We hit a lot of different things. And if anybody has any questions, absolutely. Um, for the first time, I bought grass-fed beef yep. at Walmart. And okay. It was called Market Side. Market Side, okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's the brand of meat. Got it, okay. It was, I don't mean to give it a bad name yet, but because I haven't tried others, yep. but it was horrible. Okay. It was like shoe leather. Yep. Both times. Okay. Um, and it says, this, on the label, it, this uh, meat has to be cooked slowly, mm -hmm. almost like a pot roll, which I did in my slow cooker yep. twice. Okay. I was so mad the second time that I thought, here, I'm trying to be healthy, and I can't, I gave it to my dog. Yeah. So what am I missing about Don't buy that brand. <laughs> I'm telling you flat out, don't buy that brand. Was, yeah, was that brand frozen when you bought it? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, if it was, I didn't know it because it was in the meat tray. Got it. Yeah, I, I told Walmart and I got my money back. I was so I mean, I'm, I'm glad you got your money back, but that's not the norm with grass-fed beef. Okay. And some of the things you have to look at is lean percent composition. So like... Usually when you're, you're buying meat, like whether it be like burgers or steaks or whatever, it'll give you like the fat percentage on there or it'll give you the lean mass or something, okay. some terminology related to that. So you need a little bit of fat in it. And if it's like, oh, all lean, blah, 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 and with, that's what you're dealing with, if you have to slow cook it, 100% that's what you're dealing with. Okay. That's 95% lean. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mom's organic market in the area was fantastic. What is it? Mom's, M O M S, or even Whole Foods. Yep. Um, Walmart, obviously, I don't want to be disparaging, but it's about marketing also. Exactly. Like grass fed is marketing. You yep. Oh, grass fed, yeah, that's great for me. Oh, yeah, it's, it's got to be something. Yeah. Yep. So, so usually, so, like the Whole so Foods, the they could talk to you about that. It, stuff. it might be just because it was a little too meaty. Yeah. Just like deer meat. So what, what composition am I looking for? 80-20? Yeah, 80-20 30? would be great. Okay. Yeah, that would definitely be enough to offset the taste means, that you have. 80% lean, 20% fat. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yep, so you do need some of that fat. That fat is flavor. Okay. And the leaner it gets, the chewier and not it good it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And that's true with fishes, different fishes, too. Like, if you've ever had... If you've ever caught a, a, if you've ever had sailfish, so it's similar to a swordfish, but it's all lean, and you cannot cook that in steaks. It'll it'll look similar to like a swordfish, but the only way for you to cook that thing is smoke it, and you're smoking it for like a solid amount of time, yeah. and you're eating it as jerky, and that's due to <laughs> literally due to the the lack of fat in it, and so you need that fat content in order to like get that like flavorful taste that we're all used to and like think of as the norm. Which you can find in grass-fed beef. You just have to make sure. I sure will. Yep. Because we love our beef. So yeah, we, absolutely. What about pork? Is pork too much fat that we're dealing with? Like if we want to wreck a rib once in a while or a pork roast? So everything in moderation. And no, it's not necessarily worse for you or too much fat or a worse fatty profile necessarily. But it is something that you want to pay attention to in the same way. And I want... I feel like it is harder to find pork pigs that are raised in a, a way that you get the right fatty acid profile. Um, because they're animals that will eat literally anything, and people tend to take advantage of that and tend to feed them literally anything because it's cheaper. So you don't like put your pig out and like let him like graze on grass. You like feed him slop. No, not in the same way, but there are like organic raised. There are like different terms that you can find like pigs, pork, where it's a better fatty acid profile. So that's one of those things where you might want to look for like free range, organic labels, different things like that, that would give you more of a benefit, but there aren't going to be like, it's not like cattle where you get like the grass fed type deal. Mm -hmm. Yep. that we're talking about is right. the inflammation for arteries and that, not inflammation of the joints.
joint. Correct, yes. Now there is some evidence to suggest that decreasing this low-grade systemic inflammation that we're talking about will have benefits on like pain associated with osteoarthritis. So the pain that is associated with arthritis, so degenerative bony changes that occur in 100% of the human population once you get past like 50, really. So the inflammation that occurs in that, that gives you your pain, is fairly low grade and actually will, have, will benefit from cleaning up your diet. It's not as dramatic as the effect we see on the heart because it's just so tangible, the, the effects we see on the heart. We can look at the arteries and see like placking being broken down and like there are all these different objective parameters with that. With osteoarthritis, the most subject, it's all subjective. So it's, are these people experiencing less pain? And we find that overall they are. So it's, a, it's like I said, it's not moving the needle like your knees hurt and now they don't, but it's like your knees hurt a lot and now they hurt moderate or they hurt moderate and now they hurt a little bit less. So generally it moves the needle one to two on a visual analog scale if you're strict about it and like can, are adhering to it. The other main thing that will help with like osteoarthritis pain, weight loss. And so generally cleaning up your diet, you'll get some weight loss added into that. So you'll usually have a benefit from that standpoint as well. And you don't necessarily need to be overweight either to have a benefit from losing some weight. It's as easy as like five pounds has been correlated. It's actually seven pounds has been correlated with a reduction in pain in terms of osteoarthritis knee pain. And knee pain just tends to be the most studied because so many people experience that one. But if it works in the knees, you would kind of expect it to have benefits elsewhere if you're dealing with like OA of the hip or ankle or other joints. Yep. For the low inflammation diet or yep. for Google purposes, the low fat diet. Yep, exactly. Um, how important is water consumption? Huge. Yeah. So keeping like water is pretty much the uh, only liquid that's going to 100% hydrate every type of cell in your body. And it's really important in basically keeping all your biomechanical, biochemical pathways moving. So if you're not hydrated, everything slows down and you get slower results as a result. So staying generally the rule of thumb with water, and this isn't an exact science, but it's half your body weight in ounces of water a day. But if you just casually drink water throughout the day, that's usually enough. So I, I actually recommend everybody have a water bottle that you're just refilling throughout the day and you're just casually drinking. And you know, every time you finish that water bottle, if you're at work, you get up, you go fill it again, you come back. And that'll get you more than enough water that you need. You're really not going to overdo it on water. You might have to pee a lot, but honestly, it's the benefits of it definitely outweigh the negatives. <laughs> We love our whole milk. Okay. We've just been yep. growing up with, and I know everything in moderation. So I don't hate your whole milk. <laughs> I don't. Um, One glass a day. That's what, normally what we have. Yeah, that's okay. If you like whole milk, go for it. I'm not gonna t like I said, telling you you can't have something that you love and you're used to. There's no point in cutting it out unless you're like every single day I eat a bone-in ribeye. And I'm like, oh, maybe we cut it to like three days. <laughs> like a glass of like whole milk a day is not going to move the needle very significantly, to be perfectly honest. It is like a saturated fat you're dealing with. If you have a lactose intolerance, then it can cause some additional issues. If you don't have any issue with processing it, yeah, then great. <laughs> well, that's the that's the problem you run into because the unfortunate thing is our breakfasts are, if you compare it to breakfasts around the world, our breakfasts are dessert. Like we are pretty much pure carb breakfasts. Like your bagel is just as bad as your donut, and then you take your bagel and you throw cream cheese on it, and that cream cheese is a processed spread that has also added sugars, added sodium, and also increased fat content. So our breakfast generally isn't a healthful, good breakfast, especially when you care, compare it like around the world. Most people don't eat like that. We're just very carb heavy. And th the issue with that is it's easy. Like if you wanna cook yourself eggs every morning, 
And by the way, eggs aren't bad for you either. There's a lot of eggs got a really bad rap because of dietary cholesterol, but yeah. dietary cholesterol in no way translates to your blood cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You can eat all the cholesterol you want. It's not going to move your HDL, LDL, total cholesterol needle. So don't focus on dietary cholesterol. It's just not accurate, factually inaccurate. Eggs are good for you. Eggs actually have a very good fatty acid composition between those healthy fats and those less healthy fats, those saturated fats. But you need all, basically an egg, if you look at the fatty acid profile, it's almost, I don't want to say it's ideal, but it's close to that ideal ratio that you kind of want. So go ahead and eat eggs. I'm cool with it. Say two eggs a week, I love eggs. Yeah, don't worry about eggs. Yeah, don't worry about eggs. That was a common misconception and unfortunately, there's a lot of common misconceptions in nutrition. So. I'm, I'm a new diabetic. Okay. Three weeks in. Okay. So I have a question about the added sugar. Yep. Is that, should that be added to your carbs? Like when you yep, carbs? exactly. That's exactly how it goes into. Some nutrition labels will include it in the total carb count. Other, one, it? other ones won't. So that's the other tricky thing with nutrition labels. So when you're reading that label, Usually there's a carbs and there's a, there'll be a total carbohydrate. Sometimes it'll be just carbs and then it'll be sugars. And so you're looking at carbs and there's no to total carbohydrate. And so in that scenario, you do add it, but they'll try and get around and not like show exactly what's going on in that product. But for you, especially like the added sugars are gonna be th something that you wanna, wanna, wanna focus on. So what, when you read the uh, label, what's the net carb? So you have total carbs and then you have net carbs. Right. Mm -hmm. So, does that have something to do with um, a net carb will? Or, you know, what's all that about? So, net carbs will take into account something called like sugar alcohols as well, and then it gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, but you always have to be a scientist. Yeah, I mean, like that's how you sort of have to navigate it. It's almost how it affects your body. So yeah. You have ten grams of carbs, mm -hmm. but net carbs are only four, so really, those it's only affecting. Four grams on your body. The other ones are negated by some other nutritional value. Yeah. Pretty much. The. I mean, when Go you ahead. look at it from a diabetic point of view, it's now your carbs subtract your. Get the word all from uh, fiber. Mm -hmm, exactly. That's your carb load. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah. And that gets into complex versus simple. So anything that's white and bleached and highly processed is going to be lower in fiber. So the fiber content is what leads to a slower digestion, which leads to basically, this is getting a little more complicated than I was gonna go in this lecture, but with diabetic issues, it's relevant. So that fiber load causes digestion to occur more slowly. Because digestion is occurring more slowly, you don't end up with this big sugar spike that was occurring. Higher fiber? Higher fiber. 32 grams of fiber is going to have an effect on your body, and that's what you want to have daily, especially in diabetic patient populations. So, right, 32 down. Everybody, Everybody. Everybody. yeah, 32 grams of fiber. Give us some ideas of, like, um, mm -hmm. snack fibers. Okay. Is there anything out there? Yeah. Metamucil. Metamucil is the easiest thing. It's a psyllium husk-based fiber source, and it's just very easy to get a high dose of fiber in a supplement. And that's all it is. I mean, they add, there's some added sugar into it to make it like tastier, but like the- you put it over your oatmeal or cereal. Yeah. Glass of water. Glass of water, you swish it up and you just chug. Yeah. Yeah. But like your green leaf, yeah. Your green leafy greens, your, yeah. your complex like whole grain, multi-grain breads. Okay. So complex grains, okay. com complex carbohydrates, those are gonna have fiber naturally in them. Yeah. Really, like every vegetable is going to have a degree of fiber. Okay. There are like bars and things like that. Are they not good for you? Well, they add a lot of sugar, is the downside. Yeah. But if you're talking about like I'm nowhere near my fiber load based on my diet, I'd rather you get a little bit of extra sugar and bump your fiber intake via like a fiber one bar okay. than not get any fiber at all. Okay. Well, you do oatmeal. Oatmeal is great. I do. Yeah. I, I do regularly. Great. Yeah. Have a bagel. <laughs> you know, I always think to myself, even like that skinny bread, I love that skinny wheat bread. Mm -hmm. I always think, okay, just a half. 
<laughs> my son said, Sean, my son uh, was adamant when he saw me putting like banana on my oatmeal. Yep. Mom, bananas are not good for you in the morning. So fruits aren't bad, but fruits are high in sugar. Right. So it's easy to overeat your fruits. Like people are like, I don't understand. Like I, all I eat are fruits and vegetables. And I'm like, well, what fruits are you eating and what vegetables? Like I have oranges and a banana every morning and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you named one vegetable and you named five fruits. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like there's our problem. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and there, there are fruits that are high in fiber. Like an Apple has a great fiber content in the form of pectin, is the, the name of the type of fiber in that. Is that only if you eat the skin with it? No. Uh-uh. Oh. The skin's good, too. The skin will add some extra no, bump to that. But, okay. but no, an apple without the skin still has fiber content. But when you juice something, so like, here's the, the next step with fiber. You have solu soluble fiber, and you have insoluble fiber. Soluble is fiber that's dissolved. So it's working via like mm, bio, biochemical pathways. Let's just think of it that way. Insoluble fiber is physical. It's exactly how you think of it. Like that broccoli, for example, doesn't fully break down to liquid. It is rough. It like scrapes through you, cleans you out type <laughs> deal. That is insoluble fiber. That's literally what we're talking about. So. When you juice something, so this is another trend that's been going crazy, you remove all of the insoluble fiber. So when you take <laughs> celery, which has a huge fiber content, like a celery over there, great fiber content if you just eat that celery stick. You juice it, you just got rid of the whole fiber benefit of it. Really? Yeah. I now, the reason celery became so trendy and popular in terms of like, oh, celery juicing, it's because you can fit a ton of doses of celery when you juice it. So like celery also has an antioxidant property to it that isn't fully understood. Because based on the antioxidants we know, like a serving of celery is virtually like nothing. So we really don't understand why it moves the dial as much as it does from an antioxidant standpoint. But we know it moves the dial. So it bothers a lot of scientists because they're like, but a pomegranate has this much antioxidant in it, and it's like celery has like, pomegranate has this much, celery has this much, and they're moving the dial the same way when you're like juicing celery. Wow. So, does celery have to be raw? I mean, if you cook it, do you lose it? Then? So cooking, you're gonna have some nutrient depletion that goes along with cooking. It's just the natural process; it happens. The amount that you lose is gonna be different food to food. It's gonna be different based on your preparation. It's gonna be different based on like how long it's cooked for and all that type of stuff. So ideally, raw, but it's not like you're losing 100% of the benefit of it by cooking it. So from a diabetic point of view, taking a sweet potato and cooking it in the oven versus boiling it changes the diabetic properties dramatically. Completely true, yeah. Huge, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's better to boil it? Much better. Much better. Yeah. Your glycemic index yep. changes dramatically. It does. Exactly. For diabetics, yeah. Yeah. It becomes a little bit less important when you're not in the diabetic population, but absolutely. And it's all based on something called Maillard reactions, if you want to read up on it a little bit. <coughs> so even for Bob and I, we're not diabetic yet. Yep. Hopefully never, but, you know, just boiling our sweet potatoes. It makes a difference. Yeah, I it definitely does. Boiling things, like, drains it out. Not necessarily, no. So when you, basically the reactions I was talking about, when you heat something up, when you, I mean the easiest one is to talk about with like flash frying something. So when you're frying it, the chemical composition of the food changes due to the high level of heat. When you're boiling something, you're not hitting that same temperature and the actual, the moisture around it sort of prevents things from changing that same way. Okay. So it has to do with chemical composition and it gets a little complicated, but that's basically it. Yeah. Just know that microwave is even worse. Yeah. Microwave the potato it becomes candy. Yeah. yeah. Completely. Because of the, because of the high temperature. temperature. It's the temperature. Yeah. 
changes the amount of one that I like. It literally uh, yeah. it makes the sugar like a pack. Exactly. Oh, I'm so glad we came tonight. Yeah. So that's completely true. Well, I thought mm -hmm. we beat the cleaning crew out of here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got questions that I want to answer them. Protein drink. Protein drink, yep. Premier protein. I can look it up right now. It's um, like five grams, five carbs. Yeah, tell me. Five carbs. Three fat and 30 grams of protein. The, 60. Not bad, yeah. I usually, sometimes I drink that. That's great, yeah. Lunch. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. I got Stick this with app. that. I love it. It's um, the ladies that work. My yeah, I was just going to ask. Yeah. I, that's what I've used with my clients in the past, my fitness pal. There's other ones too out there. But for that, diabetics, my net diary is really good. Mm -hmm. diary? Yeah, it's diabetic specific, especially if you get the premier edition. It's like $100 yeah. a year. So it'll help you track your insulin levels yeah. and your no, it's a good one. levels. Okay. And you'll actually track it right to the food level, and everything goes through a, a thorough review. Because it's so important that you know exactly what the carb loads are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And there's a there's a pro version of my fitness pal that will show you the carb loads too. I don't remember the the price structure and everything of that on it, but it doesn't do like as much as that one. So. so my fitness mm -hmm. pro. Not my, fitness. my fitness pal. <coughs> fitness pal will know. Anyone can enter an ingredient or you know, a food. Yep. And it's not reviewed. With my my food diary, the one I just told you, it's actually reviewed by that company to make sure it's accurate. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So it sounds like to really follow a healthier diet, you have to. Well, yeah, you know a lot, but you have to. I'm thinking to myself. You know, I used to poo poo. Well, the, I used to poo poo people who shopped at like Whole Foods. Thinking, yeah. Oh my gosh, I just can't afford that. How you know? And and yet it sounds like. That's probably where I should be shopping. It depends on the product and depends what you're looking for, to be perfectly honest. Um, it does end up, usually it does end up costing a little bit more to be healthy. Right. Unfortunately. Like, yeah. it shouldn't, but it does. But it does. Yeah. And it's a fact of life that we have to accept. Exactly. And generally, it requires preparation as well. So, like, you know, meal prepping for, like, your lunches during the week. Like... Right. You get whatever, all your salad ingredients, you get Tupperware containers, and you do it all on Sunday, and you don't think about it during the week. Right. So things like that really make a difference and make it a lot more manageable, mm -hmm. rather than like every day you having to worry about preparing food for yourself becomes challenging. Because most of those fast food options aren't great. Even when you get into like some of the salads. <laughs> so. Yeah, not every prepared food is going to be awful. Like there are like decent salads, grilled chickens, things like that that like are going to be okay. But meal prepping is definitely a way to make it more manageable, easier, and more cost effective. You know what you're getting in it. Exactly. You know yeah, completely true. Well, thank you. For Absolutely. Yes, thank you so Very good. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions, I know like nutrition is a huge topic. And I tried to keep it as basic as possible tonight, just give you like some quick things to implement. But if you have any questions on anything, uh, do we have cards, Eric? Um, I do. Just, um, just on the back of the. Oh, yeah. If we have the info on the back there. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody knows what the cards are. Yeah. Because I think once a week. Yep. We, I would love to have it more. But if in lieu of not having it more often, mm -hmm. um, should, I be, should we be taking it? A fish oil supplement, omega an omega-3? Um, potentially. It sort of depends on what the rest of your diet kind of looks like. And even in terms of fish, like you're really only getting an omega-3 dose from your fish if you're eating a cold water fish. So you're eating salmon, for example, right. or... Uh, swordfish to an extent like you need like a, a fatty fish essentially okay. so if you're eating tilapia yeah. you're not getting any omega-3 out of that no. uh, whatsoever um, and wahoo tonight. okay wahoo will have yeah 
Great. That's not bad. So omega-3 is one of those things that as a, as a dose of like two grams a day type deal is usually what people end up taking in terms of an omega-3 supplement. There's no downside to it. You're not going to cause a significant problem to you, to it, but like the supplement also matters and how you store it also matters because light denatures the omega-3 fatty acid actually. So if you're looking at a clear bottle, all that is bad and you're not getting any benefit out of it, which is something that a lot of people don't realize with it. Supplements also go bad, so sometimes you don't know like how long it's been there. So you kind of have to like do your research a little bit and know what product you're buying if you're going to get an omega-3 supplement. And to be perfectly honest, I feel like the research on whether omega-3s provide any like as a supplement provide any long-term benefit are very conflicting. And like a lot of people are like, oh, it's all BS because of that. But I think it's due to like the market being so saturated with bad products. So that's why. Personally, I think it's a good supplement, but I think brand matters and where you're getting it matters. What is a good brand? So, is it hard for you to name names? It's it's a little bit hard. What do you I use? Nature's made. Nature's made. Everything comes in a green yeah. bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and they physically print their you know manufacturing date on it instead of an expiration date. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's a good option. The one of the brands that I don't trust anymore is GNC. Um, I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole across the board. There's been so many scandals and so many issues with so many of their products that I don't even care. I, yeah, I don't even care if they like have been cleared and they're like, oh, now everything is, is what it says it is. It's like, this is the third scandal, guys. Like, what's, what's the next one? So. It's a non-regulated market. Yeah. That, that's the unfortunate thing about nutrition as a whole. Like there are nutritional supplements out there which for all intents and purposes act on your body as a drug. Like they act, they have a strong enough biochemical effect that they're acting as a drug and not as like a, oh, this is gonna like give me like a low grade effect. It's like, no, this is gonna like drop my blood sugar dramatically or this is going to like lower my triglycerides to zero. Right. And so like you, do have to know what you're doing, and it's unfortunate that it's not regulated in our country because it, it should be. Yeah. Because you're dealing with stuff where, if you don't know what you're doing, you can potentially hurt yourself, yeah. especially when you start messing around with supplements. How many do you guys take on, on um, multi? Daily multi. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of it? I actually don't. So I, I use a product called um, mm -hmm. Athletic Greens. Okay. So it's a supplement product. Yeah, it's a good one, uh, to be honest. What's it called? Athletic Greens. Yeah. And it pretty much has, it, it essentially is kind of like a multi in that you get everything you need in there and you get it beyond like a daily dose, but not in the unsafe dose on anything. So you it's. You can get it like online? You can get it online, yeah. Buy it from our free It's a subscription model, so I mean, all of month. Yep. Because I've never been faithful to it every day, but I, you know, when I think of it, if I yep. go into the right cabinet, oh, okay, I'll take one, and I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Water soluble. It's got a little bit of sweetener in it, just a tiny bit, so it tastes good. Mm -hmm. And you throw it in a bottle of water, they give you a nice little scoop, put it in there, oh, wow. drink it down, and you're done. Okay. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, like I said, any specific questions? And then also, if you want to dive a bit deeper into like personal nutrition, I do nutrition consultation here as well. And I'll dive into your blood work with you and go through everything in terms of like optimizing your blood chemistry and your lab values based on different things. I'll work with your primary care to get you off of certain med medications if that's a concern of yours. So there's a lot of things that we can work on and a lot of pretty dramatic effects that you can get. So. If you have general questions, feel free to email it along. If you want to go more specific and like really do a deep dive into like your nutrient profile and how to start making some changes, then feel free to schedule with me. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.